Good morning, and thank you for joining today's Why and How to Replace our MPLS webinar. My name is Michael Holden from Bytes. I'm pleased to be joined today by AL, uh, VP of Product Marketing at Cato Networks, who will be taking us through the bulk of today's presentation. First, some housekeeping. Attendee lines will be on mute throughout the session. There will be a Q&A at the end of the session. So please post any questions in the questions window, and they will be fielded during this Q&A. This is a purely strategic discussion. Any commercials can be discussed with your Bytes account manager after the session, and everyone will receive a recording after the session. Lastly, we have a feedback survey at the end and would appreciate it if you could take two minutes to complete this as we use it to make sure that our webinars are still hitting the mark. So the agenda for today. Firstly, a short overview of Bytes. We will then move into the majority of the presentation, which will cover common MPLS project pitfalls and how to circumvent them, how SD-WAN can improve network performance, how to use SASE to maximize the impact and cost reduction of SD-WAN, why security is still a problem for, uh, for traditional SD-WAN when traffic is encrypted, and the KPIs you should set any SD-WAN provider. We will then move into the Q&A. So, who are bytes? Bytes enable effective and cost-efficient technology sourcing, adoption, security and management of software, hardware, and cloud services. Bytes have a wide range of expertise, including licensing and SAM, data management, and security. On the security side, we have a wide range of technology partners with the highest level of accreditations with the majority of our vendors. We offer a variety of technical services, hold multiple accreditations, and boast award-winning delivery which we are extremely proud of. But that's enough about us. Let's talk about MPLS and SASE. As mentioned previously, we are joined today by AL from Cato Networks. Cato has the largest global SD-WAN black backbone. Are a Gartner sample vendor for SD-WAN, Firewall as a Service, ZDNA, and SASE, and have the world's first SASE platform. So, who better to talk to us about replacing your MPLS and SASE? And with that, over to you. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. So, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Really happy to be here with you. And today, I'm going to speak about how and why to replace your MPLS. And before I start, just a brief um, overview about Cato. We were founded five years ago by Shlomo Kramer, who is our CEO. Shlomo was one of the co-founders of Checkpoint Software and the founder and CEO of Imperva. Both are um, publicly traded, very successful companies. And his partner in crime is Gul Schatz, who was the VP of engineering at Imperva and the co-founder of CEO of Encapsula, which was the company who built the first cloud-based anti-DDoS platform. Um, so together they bring a combined experience of both uh, networking and network security domains. Um, and with them, we've raised the sum of over $200 million uh, from leading VC ventures uh, all over the, from uh, the North America. And uh, we already have, uh, through the five years that we've existed, over 600 enterprise customers spanning 100 countries, over 6,500 branches and cloud data centers connected to our service, and over 200,000 remote workers. And I'll touch on all of those aspects as I go along in the presentation. But now let's get back um, to our topic. I want to show you this um, statement that I came across uh, made by Gartner, that after decades of focusing on network performance and features, the future network innovation is going to target operational simplicity automation, reliability, and flexible business models. I'm sure that the, the main reason for you to join this webinar today is because you have an MPLS network and MPLS is no longer a fit for your organization IT needs. All businesses to go, today go through some form of digital transformation, which essentially implies that they need a network and an IT infrastructure that can move very, very fast with the business in order to stay in the competition and win against the competition. And MPLS is certainly not a kind of a technology that you can describe as fast or agile or um, you know flexible. 
to that matter. So if you, if you look at, at the network as it is today, uh, I, I think you you would feel some sympathy to this slide. You used to have a physical network that would connect between your main branch offices and your headquarters or data centers, and it would run over MPLS, and then you would egress to the internet from your data center, and everybody would backhaul over MPLS to the data center. But the reality has changed. Network has changed. You now have branches all over the world of different sizes, which doesn't necessarily mean an MPLS connection to those branches is financially justified or even feasible. You have a lot of data and applications in the cloud or moving up to the cloud in the future. And we have mobile users everywhere, especially now with COVID-19, everybody has to support allowing their employees to work from remote. But what happened over time is that in every instance where IT faced a challenge or a requirement from the business, they solved it with a point solution. So if the MPLS network is too rigid and too limited and too expensive, you're looking for an SD1 solution to replace or augment your MPLS network. But the key here, and we've mentioned the pitfalls of SD1 at the very beginning, the key here is to understand that SD1 only solves a small piece of the bigger picture. If you have data in the cloud, so you need some form of solution for cloud acceleration as well as cloud security. For your remote branches, you'll need branch security, something that would secure their internet access, as well as to connect them to an optimized network that would make sure all applications are still performing just as good as from the main offices or the data centers. And for your mobile users, you would need some solution for secure and reliable connectivity. And SD1 alone can't solve this. And that's an important point to make because when organizations look to get off of MPLS and move on to SD1, they also have to look beyond the immediate need of getting rid of the MPLS circuits and replacing them and into what would come right after. And I'll mention that throughout uh, my session today. So what Gartner actually said um, is that the digital transformation and adoption of mobile cloud and edge deployment models fundamentally change network traffic pattern. They actually say that the changes that IT are undergoing, the way that the networks are changing and the way that businesses are changing, are rendering all those network and security models completely obsolete. Continuing to solve point problems with point products is no longer a viable solution for modern network and businesses. And to solve this, Gartner came up with an architecture that is called Secure Access Service Edge, or SASE, which I'm sure most or all of you already heard about. And that was actually Cato's vision from the get-go five years ago, and only last year, Gartner kind of helped us with uh, providing an acronym for it. But this is what Cato decided to do and build since the very beginning. It's the convergence of one edge with network security delivered together as a cloud service. This is SASE and this is how your network are going to look in the near and long future and far future when you need to adjust them to the needs of a digital business. So Cato is the world's first SASE platform. As I said, we have this platform up and running since five years ago. It's converged, it's cloud native, it's global and it supports all edges. What we've done is that we took all those point products that you would used to buy, sometimes from different vendors, sometimes as a portfolio product from the same vendor that would provide SD-WAN, global backbone, branch security, cloud security and acceleration and mobile connectivity, and we converged all of them into one global cloud network, which is exactly what Gardner defined as a SASE platform. So how does it work? Let me start with explaining at a very high level and then uh, go into the details. There's just one cloud service that you need to connect all your network edges to. It can be your headquarters and data centers, your branches of all sizes, cloud data centers, mobile users, and your cloud applications, which I will explain how we connect and optimize. And then all your network traffic, both east-west traffic as well as northbound traffic to the internet goes over our cloud service. Once we see all your traffic, we can provide a security, an enterprise grade security layer, I'll elaborate on that, just by seeing all your traffic that protects 
all your edges and all your network traffic equally. And this leaves you only with the responsibility and the work to manage the network. And we offer a very flexible management model that includes self-service, co-managed, or fully managed. This means that unlike your MPLS circuits today, which you can make any configuration or changes to only through opening a ticket with the telco that you bought the MPLS circuits from, in the Cato case, you have full access to configure and do any changes by yourself should you choose to. Our cloud, which I mentioned, spans over 55 POPs, points of presence worldwide. You can see them here on the map. We're actually exactly at 58 right now, but this cloud is continuing to grow at an average pace of three to four new POPs every calendar quarter. We build POPs based on the demand of our customers. So for example, if you're an organization that we don't have a POP in a proximity to one of your branches, will accommodate that need and open a new pop in the region where you need. Or if you bought a company and you're already a Cato customer and you need reliable connectivity in the new location, we'll establish a pop in that location. This is how we drive the growth of our network. So let me go into details on how this network is architectured and all the capabilities that it offers. Starting with the global backbone, all those POPs that I just showed you are all interconnected with multiple tier one backbone providers. We buy wholesale capacity from the backbone providers of the internet and we use them to connect all our POPs in full mesh. Now all our POPs run multiple networking engines. First one is a quality aware routing algorithms that always routes data and traffic based on the best performing path. So if we need to take a packet from a host connected to our POP in Singapore to another host connected to our POP in New York, our routing algorithms would calculate in real time what is the best route to carry this packet from Singapore to New York. We can also optimize traffic that goes up to the cloud. I'll explain more about that in a few seconds. And we have built-in WAN optimization. We literally displace dedicated WAN optimization solutions like riverbeds and blue coats with the built-in capabilities of our cloud. And in order to replace MPLS circuits, a vendor has to provide the same SLA as the MPLS network. So Cato commits to a 5.9 uptime, service uptime SLA. And to deliver that, our cloud actually has something that we call self-healing architecture. It means that we've built dedicated software that knows to identify potential issues in the underlying components of our cloud and autonomously take them out of service when we see a malfunction, hand them over to our 24 seven operations team and have other elements compensate for their absence until they are fixed and reinserted into the service. As an example, if one of the backbone providers that we use is showing a high degree of packet loss that crosses our thresholds, it would be autonomously and automatically extracted from the service and traffic would be load balanced over the other backbone providers that we have in place until our operations team fix the issue with this specific provider and reinsert it into the service. We have perfected this self-healing um, architecture to a degree that a voice over IP call wouldn't disconnect in the event that something like that happens. On the security side, we have a built-in next generation firewall. It is not a virtual machine of a third-party firewall that we are hosting on our service like many telcos do, but our own homegrown next generation firewall that was designed to interact natively with the other security and networking components. We have built-in secure web gateway capabilities, advanced threat prevention that include multiple anti-malware engines and intrusion prevention as a service and full cloud and mobile security, which gives you visibility to all the cloud applications that your users are using and granular access control on who accesses what applications and in what conditions. So how do you connect to this cloud that I'm showing you here and all the capabilities that it offers? From your physical locations, we offer an Edge SD1 device. It's a small box that can do everything every other SD1 in the market can do. It can aggregate multiple internet circuits in active, 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 or active, passive mode. It can run dynamic path selection, so it can drive traffic based on the underlying transport conditions in terms of packet loss, jitter, and availability. 
it can do quality of service, but not only based on the application that you're using, like voice over IP, but also based on the identity of the user. This means that you can prioritize, for example, voice over IP traffic of a sales team over voice over IP of engineering, which is obviously a value for your organization, and it can overcome last mile packet loss. The combination of having these capabilities over the last mile from the branch to our POP and our global private backbone on the middle mile gives an equivalent performance and reliability of an MPLS-based network, but at a fraction of the cost. We also have a data center model, and we also support coexisting with MPLS circuits um, to allow you to set policy-based routing, which gives you the ability to control which traffic continues to go over your MPLS circuits and which should go over our cloud service. I can tell you that in the majority of the customers that come to us, they start with an MPLS augmentation project, which means they are looking to buy SD1 to achieve more bandwidth for their list critical business applications. But after they do a proof of concept and they get hands on on our service and try it for themselves, they switch from MPLS augmentation to a full MPLS replacement once they've seen how our network performs. If you have existing uh, firewalls or routers at your data centers and you don't care for last mile SD1 optimization, you can also use them to connect to our cloud over an IPsec protocol. The next piece is the mobile workforce. Um, this is something that is completely overlooked by SD1 vendors and one of those examples of where just looking at SD1 to replace MPLS um, is kind of a short-sighted vision. When you're moving from your MPLS to an SD1 solution, you still need to solve the issue of your mobile workforce. It would not go away. Either you solve it from a third-party solution that you buy like a VPN concentrator or an SDP service, or that you find a SASE platform that also has capabilities around mobile workforce connectivity. And this is the case with Cato. With Cato, mobile users, regardless of their whereabouts, whether they are in the working from home or traveling, when we can all go back to traveling on business again, can connect to our cloud service either using a lightweight client or uh, using a web browser in a clientless manner they would automatically find the nearest Cato pop and from there get onto our network and benefit from all those network optimizations and security capabilities that I've described, just like the office users. Essentially, mobile users in the Cato SASE platforms are first-class citizens on the network, just like office users. This means that when your users go home and connect from remote, you would not hear any complaints about applications being slow or not working because they no longer backhaul to your VPN servers at the data center and from there reach their applications. They would always get onto our cloud from the nearest Cato pop and from there benefit from everything we have to offer. We can also connect your cloud data center, whether they are on AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Oracle Cloud, or wherever. There are two ways to go about this. One is to use an agentless connection. We leverage the IPsec capabilities of all the cloud providers and establish an IPsec tunnel from the nearest scale pop to the cloud, giving you a near zero latency between the scale pop and your cloud data centers. Or alternatively, you can instantiate a virtual version of the scale socket, a V socket, and use that as the gateway in from it to connect to our network. Cato Pops, which I showed you on the map, are all hosted in top tier data centers worldwide. It means that we are in the same data center facilities as the, lead, the world leading cloud applications, the SaaS of the world, and the leaders of the cloud data centers. So the traffic between the Cato Pop and the cloud data center actually doesn't even leave the data center backbone and go out to the internet. This capability and this presence of Cato at those data centers actually allows you to avoid the additional cost of private connections like AWS ExpressRoute or, uh, or Azure Direct Connect. And lastly, we can also optimize traffic that goes to cloud applications. Some of the cloud applications, actually still most of the cloud applications, still keep your data 
as a subscriber in one regional location. So if you're subscribed to Salesforce and you're, for example, based headquartered in the UK, Salesforce data is most likely to be in their data center in London. But if you're a global organization, then you have remote users that also need to access this instance of yours on Salesforce. And without Kato, they would access Salesforce over the public internet. So if they're connecting from the Asia Pacific or from North America, there is nothing to guarantee their Salesforce experience. But if you are a Kato subscriber, what would happen is that as soon as they turn on their Kato client, their traffic would be identified as Salesforce and would drive our private backbone all the way to our pop in London, where it would come off our cloud and get into the Salesforce data center in the same physical facility. So to summarize this, we're actually giving you an MPLS-like experience all the way from your cloud applications and down to your mobile users that even work from home or in your worldwide offices. And everything that I just mentioned, everything that I've just described is fully configurable by yourselves. You can go into the management applications that we provide, which is web-based, and do all the monitoring and configurations that you want when you want to do it. But you can also leverage our partners like Bytes to co-manage or fully manage this for you. Now, I've mentioned several times that Part of the, 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 the thinking about um, what technologies to choose when you want to get off of MPLS is the consideration between a standalone SD-WAN solution or a SASE. We can look at it like the distinguish between a tactical decision and a strategic decision. SASE is a form of a strategy for your WAN transformation, and let me explain to you why I'm saying that. So you are now at the point where you are looking to replace MPLS with an SD-WAN solution. You want to increase the bandwidth, maybe to also reduce the cost or to optimize your network spend. So you can buy or subscribe to a SASE that has SD-WAN capabilities. And please pay attention that not all SASE platforms come with built-in SD-WAN capabilities. Some would force you to partner with a third party, or you can get an Edge SD-WAN solution. Both options would provide you the MPLS replacement solution that you are after. But let's continue with this WAN transformation journey over time. If you're a global organization or you're going to expand globally in the future, you would need something that would guarantee a reliable and optimized global connectivity. So if your SASE platform that you chose at the beginning already has that, you benefit from it at the flip of a switch. If you chose an Edge SD-1 solution at the beginning, now you also need to integrate a global private backbone to achieve reliable global connectivity. As you move from MPLS to SD-1, you would need internet circuits everywhere, which means you'll need secure direct internet access. A SASE platform already has that capability for you, but if you chose an Edge SD-1 at the beginning, now you also need to integrate it with an X-Gen firewall or a UTM or a secure web gateway through service chaining in order to also achieve the security you need for your enterprise network. And as you migrate from your on-prem applications to the cloud, whether it's to cloud data centers or cloud applications, like software as a service, you now also need to optimize cloud access. And again, SASE has that for you already there. And otherwise you would need to leverage some of the capabilities that global backbones provide to optimize access. And the same for optimized mobile access for your mobile workforce. So if we go back to the beginning, when we said that organizations are looking at operational simplicity, flexibility, the ability to move fast, IT teams want to be business enablers, not business inhibitors, because everything is slow and rigid. If you make the strategic decision of choosing a SASE to replace your MPLS network, a SASE with a built-in SD-1 to replace your MPLS networks, you are future-proofing your network for whatever comes next. But if you choose a point solution, it would solve your MPLS need today, but can't sustain any future needs that you're going to face in the next one, two, or three years. And that would leave you without a unified management, with a pile of point solutions that you are integrating or spending money on someone else's to do the integration and maintenance for you, and would not get you to the point that you're an agile IT organization 
like a digital business. I want to give you another perception or another prisma to look at the SASE value for when transformation. If you look at a traditional stack of IT, you have the network, the security, the cloud, the mobile, and the management of everything, and it all runs over your network transport, that being internet, MPLS, or 4G LTE. We can break this down into the various products. So on the network, you would have private backbone, SD1, and one optimization solution. On the security, you'll have UTMs at the branches, big next-gen firewalls at the DCs, and maybe a secure web gateway with the management. Cloud would require cloud firewall for, the, for your infra as a service, and a CASB solution, cloud access security broker, to control access to cloud applications. And then for your mobile workforce, you'd either be using a legacy VPN concentrator or a modern SDP or ZTNA solution. And all those require their own separate management applications. Now, look at all those point products that you have today. For each and every one of them, you went through a cycle of evaluating multiple vendors, choosing which one you want to POC and POCing them, then going through the procurement process, then integrating them into the network and continuous maintenance and troubleshooting. There is tons of hidden costs and repetitive specific cycles of procurement and management and maintenance of all those point products. But if you choose a SASE platform, if you make this strategic decision to go with the SASE that already has all those capabilities built in, then you don't spend or you don't waste all this time, money, and resources on this procurement cycle. Those hidden costs go away and actually frees you as the IT teams, as IT leaders, to focus on configuring the SASE platform to best support business growth and expansion, rather than keeping just keeping the lights on and maintaining all those point solutions. So um, I've mentioned that Kato is the world's first SASE, and I've mentioned a few times that there are many other SASE platforms out there. Um, and it's really important now when everybody's uh, claiming SASINESS to be able to distinguish what is a SAS and what isn't a SAS. And Gartner actually made a very clear definition of what are the critical architectural elements of a SAS platform. Whether you buy a Cato solution or not, if you're looking at a SAS to replace your MPLS and to future proof your network, you have to make sure it ticks all the right boxes. The first box is convergence. It has to have both the networking and security as a native combined software delivering the service. If network is one and security is another solution, it's not converged, it's not a SASE. It has to be cloud-based. If you get the same convergence, but it's coming from an on-prem appliances, then it's geographically bounded and it's not taking you to where you need to be to support business growth and digital transformation. So it has to be cloud-based. It has to be global, which means that it has to serve you from everywhere your organization is, and it has to have multiple pops all over the world, and it has to support all edges, not just your branch offices with appliances, but your headquarters, branches, physical data centers, cloud data centers, and all the way down to the mobile users. So with saying what SASE is, let's just take a quick look at what isn't a SASE. SASE isn't chaining point solution. If someone tells you, look, in order for you to get a SASE, you need to buy an SD1 from one vendor and then service chain it to a secure web gateway, for example, it's not converged and therefore it's not a SASE. You are already buying two products instead of one. Again, if it's an on-premise -prem box, even it has the security and the SD1 capabilities combined, it's not delivered as a cloud service, it's not cloud, it is not a SASE. And lastly, if it's a telco bundle that presumably delivers everything from a cloud, which is the telco data center, but essentially it's a set of virtual machines manually integrated with each other and delivered either from the telco data center or an on-prem, CPE, it's not really converged, it's not really cloud, and it's definitely not a SASE. 
So before I conclude, I want to share with you um, kind of a summary of the results of a survey that we ran earlier in the year. Um, and we've, we had over 1,300 IT leaders participate in this survey, and we wanted to know if they feel that they are this guy, you know, that sits on the balcony in the, in the vacation in the summer and is almost worry-free. And the way that we try to understand it is that we went to all those IT leaders and we asked them if they have gone through any kind of project of digital transformation, be it um, moving from MPLS to SD1, doing cloud migration, expanding the business through um, merger and acquisitions, buying another company, these kind of initiatives or doing rapid deployment, opening quick pop-up stores or quick construction sites, those things describe a digital transformation initiative. And we ask them what was the infrastructure that they did this digital transformation on and how confident they felt that this infrastructure can support digital transformation and what was their feeling after digital transformation. So we compared their level of confidence on four different criteria before and after digital transformation. So the first criteria was agility. We wanted to know how confident they are that their network, their infrastructure can accommodate new sites, extend to new regions, and quickly move workloads to the cloud. The typical cases of agility needed for digital businesses. Those organizations as MPLS, which are probably like most of you, already know that MPLS can't reach the cloud. It's very slow. It doesn't get anywhere. So they weren't very confident about it at the beginning, and they were even less confident after digital transformation. If they had a mix of MPLS and VPN, they had some assurance that they can get through the agility requirements, but they realized they can't after. SD-WAN started with a lot of confidence, but it degraded after digital transformation because SD-1 is designed to replace MPLS in physical location. It is not designed to support moving workloads to the cloud. And SASE, which was a new technology, surprised for the better. When we asked about performance, how confident are you that your network can support the performance requirements of IA, SAS, voice, and large data transfer? Again, MPLS failed quite miserably because it's limited in bandwidth, because bandwidth is so expensive and it doesn't get anywhere and forces backhauling. MPLS and VPN, kind of a mesh, had some confidence which decreased after. SD1 started very confident and dropped because again, SD1 can't get you into the cloud. It can support enterprise voice over IP. If it has built-in web optimization, it can also support large data transfers like some of the SD1s do but it doesn't help you with cloud like IS and SAS. And again, SAS excelled and surprised for the good. In terms of management and operation, how confident are you that you can quickly identify problems, deliver deep visibility to all traffic, and overcome last mile issues without downtime? So MPLS gives you very little visibility. It's really hard to debug issues and to solve and manage SD1, uh, sorry, MPLS, you are fully dependent on the telco. This also takes its toll when you're looking at a mesh of MPLS and VPN. SD1 gives you better visibility, but again, because it only covers east-west traffic and not northbound or cloud traffic, then your visibility and troubleshooting capabilities are limited, and SASE covers everything, east-west, northbound, incoming traffic, when enterprise traffic, internet traffic, uh, software as a service, SAS, SASE sees everything. So your management and operation capabilities with SASE are only surprising for the good. And the last piece is security. How confident are you that your network can secure traffic, limit users' access to specific resources, and protect mobile and cloud resources? And here again, MPLS, as you would expect, failed miserably. If you're on an MPLS and VPN, you're likely delivering this VPN based on next-gen firewalls, so you already have some degree of security in most of your locations. SD1 gives you some visibility, but the security part of SD1 usually comes from another solution. But if you already have SD1, you have internet everywhere, so you have some degree of security. 
And Sassi, which started very confident, surprised even for the better on top of that. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, how an MPLS is fit for when transformation and for digital transformation, how is it going to support what you need to future-proof IT for whatever the business is going to ask of you, you can see that if you're running on MPLS, which I'm sure you know, you're in a very bad position and you're looking to replace it. If you have a mesh of MPLS and VPN, you've made some progress towards where you need to be, but you're not fully there. SD1 gets you a significant way or significant part of the journey, but it doesn't get you to where you actually need to be. It only solves part of your solution. And this is very critical. This is what we came together here to discuss. What is the right technology to replace my MPLS? And the answer is SASE, because SASE is more than just SD1. SASE has the security, it supports your mobile workforce, it supports your cloud data centers and cloud applications, and it gives you the visibility and the management capability and agility that you need to be an agile IT organization for a digital business. So I'm gonna stop here after talking for uh, over 30 minutes straight, and let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Hi, so um, yes, we have got a few questions. Um, so let me start off with the first one that came in. And uh, this is virtual firewalls, SD-WAN in AWS as a question. I suppose, is that a possibility? It's a question. Ah, so is it a virtual, uh, so the, can you repeat the question, please? So virtual firewalls, SD-WAN enabled in AWS. So no, we don't offer virtual firewalls or SD-WAN in AWS. What we do is that we have a one cloud-based firewall as a service. It would provide you with the security and firewalling capabilities you need to secure your AWS VPCs, virtual private clouds. And in order to connect them to the service, you can choose between an agentless option, which is based on AWS uh, virtual private gateway, IPsec capabilities, or instantiating a virtual Edge sd one device. But the security would come from our cloud service and not from a virtual machine inside your VPC, which is better because it would give you a unified and equal security policy throughout, that's one point. And the other point is that you don't need to pay extra for a virtual machine hosting a virtual firewall. Okay, so then the next question we have is, um, I want to replace on-site firewalls. What does your on-prem device look like? So we have two on-prem devices. First of all, we can definitely replace on-prem firewalls and we are happy to replace on-prem firewalls. We've been doing this for many years. The Edge device that we offer actually comes in two models. We have a branch model, which is called the X1500, and we have a data center model, which is called the X1700. Now the X1500, the branch model, actually supports a throughput of up to 500 megabits per second. It's a lightweight device, and the way that it can carry so much traffic is because all the heavy lifting is done in our cloud pop. So what the edge device really does is just establish a secure and encrypted tunnel to the nearest SCADA pop, and then the pop does all the security processing and enforcement and threat prevention that you would use to get from an on-prem appliance. And that's a very important point because when I say 500 megabits per second, that's a definitive number. It would not degrade when you switch on more features on our service. You can turn on IPS and you can turn on uh, malware prevention and you can turn on TLS inspection. It would always be 500 megabits per second because all the processing is done in the cloud and not at the edge. This is what is called a thin edge. Our data center model, the X1700, can actually carry up to two gigs per second of traffic and it comes with uh, fiber handoffs to support data center connectivity. And again, this is a definitive number. So we can definitely replace your branch or on-site uh, firewalls with our cloud security stack. Great, and then we've got, we've got a few more. Just a reminder, if, if you do have any questions, please do put them into the questions window. Um, so the next question is, 
what are the bandwidth limits with MPLS? So, uh, in general, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. Sorry if I'm not. In general, MPLS has bandwidth limit because of cost. It's very expensive and as a result, customers buy very limited capacity of MPLS circuits, especially when it goes overseas. If it's within the UK or even within Europe, prices are still manageable, uh, much more expensive than public internet, but still somewhat reasonable. But if you're trying to connect to India, for example, I can tell you from a customer that I've worked with that a connection from India to UK would cost about 5,000 US dollars per megabits uh, per month for an MPLS circuit. That's crazy expensive, whereas doing it over an SD1 with a global backbone like ours, it would be a fraction of that. So this is why MPLS is limited. This is why organizations buy limited bandwidth of MPLS and try to maximize it with WAN optimization solution. And from Kato perspective, um, we don't see any limitations. So you can connect any size of MPLS circuits to our edge devices, and we can still do policy-based routing and offload some of the traffic from MPLS to our cloud until you decide to retire your MPLS altogether and move everything to run over our service. Right, so then we've um, next question we've got is, do you have the Gartner Magic Quadrant to show us? So Gartner doesn't yet have a magic quadrant from for SASE. It's a completely new category, which Gartner uh, defined as a transformational category. It means that it's not going to augment or enhance existing technologies, but to replace them altogether. Right now, we are in the all mentioned in all SASE um, documents that come out from Gartner in the latest, both network, enterprise network, and network security hype cycle documents, which were just released last month. Um, Kato is mentioned as a sample vendor across multiple categories, SASE, SD1, Fowl as a service, and Zero Trust Network Access. Um, so there's no MQ yet for that, but we're definitely one of the leading players in this market, and certainly the one who were there first. Okay, so then the next question is, what would be the solution if you have to utilize some MPLS connect connectivity for some third party system outside your organization? Oh, that's uh, very simple. You can always connect a third party network or, subs or subnet over MPLS to our network. You can keep the MPLS router and publish the subnets over BGP, which we support, or you can put one of our edge devices at your partner's or third-party partner network, and it would establish the connectivity over MPLS. There are several ways to go about it. What most of our customers do is that they use an IPsec tunnel to connect uh, their partners instead of MPLS, and then they can save that cost as well but we support all options and it can be gradual. No one has to switch over to our full solution overnight. You can start with moving some of your sites and parts of your network and increase your footprint over our service when the time and budget suits you. Okay, the next question is, how do you manage applications on your SASE platform? Is there some point of traffic steering? Yes, absolutely. So we are full layer seven application aware, which means that we have a database of applications which we maintain for our customers. We have a dedicated security research team that this is part of their responsibility. And then you can define how do you want to steer specific applications, whether you want it to go over a specific internet circuits or load balance and what the failover policies would be, and even from which pop you want them to egress out to the internet. So everything is configurable and manageable and there are real-time and historical analytics that you can look into and save the application steering behaved as you expected. Great, so then we've got one more question. Um, so is this still a, um, a good or the right solution for a company solely based in the UK? Um, with only seven offices and about 700 staff, 
um, we're relatively small. I'm not sure if this is an appropriate or cost-effective solution. So I actually appreciate this question very much. Um, I think that even a small organization, and actually seven sites and you know 700 employees is not so small. Um, it's already a, a successful business. There is a lot of value to using a SASE solution. Besides getting you off of MPLS and uh, you know making sure all your branches are connected through a reliable last mile SD1 optimization, will eliminate the need to invest and maintain on-prem security stack. You'll have a unified security policy and full visibility across your entire organization. And in times like COVID, and there might be a second wave and hopefully not a third wave, when you need to move 700 employees to work from home with a solution like Kados, um, this happens in hours, not days. You don't have to buy more servers to now support 700 employees instead of 50 that you used to support before, as an example. We are future-proofing your network for whatever comes next. And this level of confidence um, is actually very valuable to organizations of all sizes. And I think that even in we won't discuss commercials here, but I think that um, if you'd like to explore this further with Bytes, you'll see that we can be very cost competitive to the alternative um, appliance-based stack that you would need to build to support everything your IT needs. Great, and we've actually just had another question come in, and I think this will probably be the last one. So, um, is there an advantage to taking an SD-WAN with one vendor and security with another vendor, and then to add it to Kato? How does this benefit the organization? I don't think this is the advantage. I actually think this is the wrong way to go about building your IT. I think that what we've all learned, what the industry learned through the passing 30 years, and I think this is exactly what Gartner speaks about when they're saying that the old way of doing of building IT is obsolete is by doing that. I think that choosing one vendor for one for one um, you know, subject and another vendor for another topic, like one for SD1, one for security, one for cloud. This is what creates the complexity that eventually got out of hand. And instead of having IT teams working on driving business growth and focusing on configuring the network to support what the business needs, they are too busy in just keeping the lights on and making sure everything is is working and all the integrations don't break and the applications continue to work and perform. So the benefit, the way to move forward, the way I and Cato believe should be, is through moving to a converged SASE platform like ours and not continuing to solve point problems with point solutions. Great, so we've got another one that's come in. Um, so how does the VPN work for end user devices? Can it be set to be always on without any interaction um, from the user like direct access or Windows 10 always on VPN? Absolutely, yes. So we can set an always on with enforcement to prevent users from turning it off. We can. We actually have another benefit that with the Kato SDP, uh, which replaces VPN, you don't have to do something that is called split tunneling because most organizations have a VPN concentrator that is stationed in the headquarters when traffic requires that mobile users would backhaul to the data center. And if they also want to access internet resources, that slows them down and degrades application performance or internet performance. So what organizations do in order to avoid complaints from the end users is that they say they configure the, the, SD, the VPN client to split the traffic so that when traffic goes to the VPN concentrator and that internet traffic goes out directly, and then they lose the security that they would go through when they backhaul to the data center. In the Kato case, all the users would go always to the nearest Kato pop and would go through our entire security stack there. So you can actually avoid this split tunneling situation. All the traffic from the end user would go to the nearest Kato pop. If it's inside the UK, we have one pop in Ireland, one in London. So it's no more than 10 to 15 milliseconds round trip time to the nearest Kato pop, which is nothing, completely unnoticeable by human users. 
and then in the pop it would go through the entire security inspection and then it would be routed to its final destination whether that be on-prem data center application or internet or cloud resources so you benefit both from an optimized traffic and always on client and avoiding split tunneling Right, so that was the last question that has come in. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to everybody who's attended today. I know that it's uh, tough to sometimes get an hour out of your day to spend with us, so we do appreciate it. And um, thank you very much to Al as well for presenting, and I believe that everybody found it very informative. Um, as mentioned before, I will be sending the recording out um, shortly, so please look out for that. And if you do have any questions, Please, any more questions, please do send them to either reply to my email or send them to tell me more at bytes.co.uk with the reference of the uh, webinar's name. And with that, thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much for hosting me. Thank you.